Hi, welcome to the Cinematography Salon podcast, a show about celebrating cinematography and inspiring both the current and next generation of visual artists, exploring the latest trends, techniques, technologies, and culture, and featuring exclusive interviews with some of the most talented and innovative cinematographers working today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cinematography Salon podcast. My name is Peter Pascucci, and today I'm joined by my co-host, Ava Benjamin Shore. We are incredibly excited to welcome Jay Holbin, an associate member of the ASC and co-author of the legendary Cine Lens Manual. Jay is a longtime author and founder of the Shotcraft column in the ASC magazine and author of the recently released book, Shotcraft. Jay is also a working director and producer in Los Angeles and a wealth of knowledge on Hollywood and in the technical side of things. Jay, thank you so, so much for joining us today and welcome to the Cinematography Salon. Thank you for having me. It's really exciting to be here. Awesome. We're very excited to kick it off today and dive into some technical stuff and just hear from you about a variety of topics. I wanted to start broad because I feel like you're someone who's been involved in so many historic cinematography related texts and you recently published Shotcraft Book, which is an incredible resource for cinematographers and filmmakers, as well as the Cine Lens Manual, of course, which so many people know you for, as well as like contributions to the American Cinematographer Manual, which is a resource that I absolutely love. It's so easy to look at and reference. Um, but I was curious, sort of at a high level, like if you could describe how these texts differ from a practical standpoint and how a cinematographer can think about each of these resources as a practical means of refining their craft. That's a great question, actually. Um, let's start with the ASC manual because that has the longest history and is probably the most versatile. You know, the, the ASC manual is tried to do, it originally came out in the 1930s under a different title, the American Cinematographer Annual. And then in the 60s, it became the American Cinematographer Manual. And the idea is to cover as much territory as possible to give a little bit of insight into everything in cinematography. And that's a really lofty goal, right? It's a really hard thing to achieve. But you want to be able to have one book that you could look up for depth of field tables or miniature photography or underwater photography or composite photography or whatever topic to get some basic foundation in that. What we did with the Cine Lens Manual is the complete opposite. We took one subject and put everything that we possibly could into it. In fact, Chris and I, over the eight years that we were doing that book, were constantly challenging each other to, hey, I found something new, I'm putting it in. Oh, hey, I found this new, I'm putting it in. So we wanted to be as comprehensive on a single subject on cinematography as possible. Shotcraft, the book, is based on a column that I've been writing since 2017 for American Cinematographer. And that's little educational tidbits on all sorts of topics very similar to the ASC manual, but it also covers things like career and mentorships and how to ask for help and a lot of other things that don't normally get talked about very commonly. So they're a great complement to each other. I recommend everyone buy all three. And as a matter of fact, a copy of all three for every room of the house. <laughs> I love that. I'm sure a lot of our listeners are probably familiar with all three of these, but I'm, I was excited to kind of have you just give us like a very high level overview. And I think those perfect. So uh, it's very cool. Yeah. So Jay, I'd be curious to know, like beyond the text that you just listed, are there any others that you think are essential for cinematographers and what would they offer that is unique? Yes. I mean, there's an extraordinary amount. I mean, you can see the bookshelves behind me. Um, honestly, if anybody looks at those, those are mostly Stephen King behind me. But I've got 60 feet of bookshelves in my home. My education is reading. I'm a college dropout, junior college dropout. So I taught myself and almost all of that was in books. So I have several bookshelves that are dedicated to filmmaking and most of it is dedicated to cinematography. I think in that, one of my favorite, because it was an early book for me, it taught me a lot, was Chris Malkowitz's cinematography. And David Mullen worked with him on an updated version of that. But as a foundation text, I am a huge fan of it. I also really liked Dave Vera's lighting for digital and film cinematography, which is out of print now, but there's a couple of versions that you can still get. Beyond that, there's or we could talk about... Uh, hundreds of them. It's Dave Stump's digital cinematography. He literally wrote the book on digital cinematography. I have two other books that one of them's out of print, hard to find now, but A Shot in the Dark and Behind the Lens. Um, 
it's really more of a director's book, but I'm a real big fan of it. Shot by Shot by Steve Katz, I think is a great book that talks about ideas of coverage and why we put cameras in certain places. Um, so those are some of the ones that come immediately to mind, but I could talk for an entire day just on great books. I was curious, like, you know, as we kind of touch on the Cine Lens Manual a little bit, I've heard you tell this amazing story of how the initial spark of that happened when you visited Panavision with Christopher Probst ASC and, and saw Guy McVicker give this pretty wild lens talk about um, glass and, and it, you realized that it was important for you all to continue down this path and like discover more and everything. I was curious, when did that happen? Like era wise, like how many years ago is that? Because it was so interesting to hear you talk about like discovering K35s at that point and a lot of the discoveries that came out of that and any kind of part of that story you want to share i'm sure people would love to hear you were very kind to me in the recap of that story because the truth is when guy gave us that presentation both chris and i realized we knew nothing about lenses and between the two of us we had you know almost 20 years of experience as cinematographers at that point and it was humbling and it was i don't want to say embarrassing but it was really humbling to be in that situation of, oh my God, there's this entire world that we know nothing about. And the era of that, it was somewhere around 2012, mm. I think, 2013. And that lecture that Guy gave us, or the presentation that Guy gave Chris and I that day, inspired Chris and I to do a series of really intensive tests. And we were able to go back to Panavision and test every 50 millimeter lens that they had in stock at that time on two different cameras. And then we went to Camtech cameras in Burbank, California, and tested every 50 millimeter lens that they had in stock. And what we saw from that, what we really learned from that, was the extraordinary differences between all of these lenses. And Chris loves to call that the Denny's menu, because I put still captures of that into a single document, and then he would say, oh, this is the flavor I want for my next job. And this is the flavor I want for my next job. And he went off and did that and started collecting lenses. And he fell in love with the K35s based on that test and started buying those like crazy. And I went the other way. I went into research, into wanting to know and understand why they were different. Why was an S4 so different from a K35 or a Lomo or a Cook Speed Pancro? What was these difference? So I, I went really deep into that and then started teaching at the Global Cinematography Institute at the time about what I was learning. Super interesting. I think you mentioned how rigorous lens testing could be. And I think for a lot of cinematographers, there's the way that we test in a very subjective way, like more just subjectively. And then there's the very objective way of testing that is very technical and very specific and rigorous. Could you just talk a little bit about the chapter in Cine Lens Manual that kind of is a great resource for people who are maybe wondering how to do a proper lens test can look to? Absolutely. And, you know, you define basically the two categories of that, which is, for me, I call them a generic lens test or a specified lens test. The specified lens test is for a specific project. And in that case, you want to test, you know, as close as you can to your actors. If you can actually get your actors, that's wonderful. Wardrobe, makeup lighting, props, the look that you want for that project, including any filtration. You want to play with all of that applied to that project. When I test lenses, normally I'm not doing them for a project. I'm doing them because there's a new series of lenses out. So I do a generic lens test where I want to expose as many of the characters of those lenses as I possibly can. And I want to do that as efficiently as possible. So I have a particular setup that I do that will, within a single shot, reveal spherical aberration, chromatic aberration, astigmatism, uh, field flatness, uh, acutance, contrast, the quality of the bouquet. And I can look at all of that in a single shot and then take a little bit further and do isolated tests for every one of those characteristics. So that's where you get kind of into the objective versus subjective way of testing. And we go through all of that in the manual, of course. Do you also test out new sensors when they come out? Like, is that something you're also interested in? Because I know that as DPs, that's, I guess, something that some 
DPs still do like they would test an old film stock like over under like is that something you do too not in quite a while uh, so when I was teaching for the Global Cinematography Institute, I taught a class on digital cinematography. And in every iteration of advanced digital cinematography, we would get the newest cameras and run them through dynamic range tests and color fidelity tests. Mm -hmm. But because I'm not an active DP anymore, I leave that up to my cinematographers to deal with. And I'm honestly getting to a point where I'm kind of lost. You know, I'll say something stupid to the DP that I work with quite a bit, Katie Williams, and I'll, I'll say, well, yeah, maybe the, the Monstro is a better choice for that. She'll be like, the Monstro is out of date. It's a Raptor now. I'll be like, okay, right. Yeah, the Raptor XL V2 2849. <laughs> yeah, it just gets to a point where I'm not tracking that detail as much anymore. Mm. Yeah. I think it's actually an interesting segue into this one question we had, which was, um, you know, like I feel as cinematographers, it, it is hard to keep up with things changing. And I thought it was really interesting when you and David Mullen were talking about trying to like find a way to learn foundational concepts and breaking down complex things into more core concepts. And, you know, as someone who's been an educator for such a long period of time, can you talk a little bit about how cinematographers can maybe learn from this technique of breaking down complex subjects into more accessible ideas? It's a tough thing to do. And it's something that I've seen a lot of great cinematographers not be able to do when they come in and do a guest lecture or a class. You know, is some of the top in the industry have had a chance to sit and watch them teach because they came into the GCI when I was there. And it would be really frustrating because they do a setup and say, here you go, this is why. And a student would say, why? Well, that, because that's where it goes. You know, I, I put the 10K there because that, that's where it goes. So it takes a lot of effort to be able to go inside yourself and say, okay, so why I put the 10K there? I wanted more of a half light, but I didn't want it leaking on the shadow side. So I'm pushing it a little bit towards the back to give me that half light, but I still want key in the eye and I want to throw the shadow over to the side. And you have to analyze yourself to find out why you did that. Because so many pros, they learn this stuff, they learn the fundamentals, they learn the pyramid of exposure or the triangle of, of exposure. Pyramid, triangle is the same thing, right? Yeah. They learn the triangle of exposure and then they forget about it. You don't think about it anymore. So you get to a point where these things become instinctual. Because I've had to teach and write for so many years, I've had to continually analyze every decision that I make and come into extremely complex ideas like Nyquist, Shannon, Sampling Theorem and say, okay, what does this mean and how do we break it down into simple components? So something like that, we have to first start talking about what is detail and then what is resolution and then how many photo sites there are in a sensor and what a photo site is and then how that works within the idea of sampling and what sampling is. So you break all of these concepts down to get to a point of and that's why we end up with more ray in an image because of breaking the Nyquist Shannon level. So instead of just throwing out something incredibly complicated, you have to simplify it and start with the foundation. And almost every lecture that I do, because I get different audiences showing up, I will tell people right at the top that I'm going to start with some fundamentals. And we're going to talk about those first. And then I'm going to build up and we're going to get to some new stuff. Some of you might be bored for a little bit or think that this is a little tedious but I'm gonna levelize the playing field and make sure that everybody knows what I'm talking about. And invariably, I will get the top pros coming up to me at the end of it saying, you know what, that was really fun going back to the fundamentals because hearing it a little bit differently helped me think about it a little differently. Which, this is not the question you asked, but it segues into how I learned, how books taught me what I know. And what I figured out was when I was trying to learn a particular subject, I would buy three books on the subject. And I would read the first cover to cover. But if I hit a point in that book where I didn't understand something, there was nobody to ask. I couldn't go to a teacher and be like, hey, what does this mean? So then I would go to book two and I would look up that subject in there 
and read a different author's interpretation of that subject. And then go to book three and read a different interpretation. By the time I got there, it'd be, okay, oh, I get it now. Then I go back to book one and I complete it. And then I go into book two, read it cover to cover, and a lot of the information is going to be the same. Okay, I get it. Oh, that's new. Okay, that's cool. And then go to book three, and by the time I get there, okay, now it's really sinking in because it all makes sense. So that helps in the idea of coming at subjects from a different perspective and explaining it a little bit differently. And all of that is fundamental to being able to explain complex ideas. And it took me a really long time to answer that question and explain that. Well, I think what's really interesting about that is that, you know, I love that Shotcraft is included in the ASC magazine. I think from a practical standpoint, it's like, well, everyone reads the ASC magazine, you know, like if you're a new cinematographer or if you're an established ASC member, you, you read that. But I also noticed like, because I too am mostly self-taught in cinematography, sometimes you'll go several years understanding something or feeling something intuitively. But maybe when you originally read, say about diffusion, you weren't really ready for that information to sink in fully by having, I think that might even go for not just me, but other people. You can be a working DP, not fully digest that information, even though you're kind of skimming through it and reading it, but to like still be including that in a professional magazine means that also people can be digesting it, even if they are a working DP and they have an incredible reel, you know, like I appreciate that you do the shot craft column because there are things in there that I read maybe this year or last year and have just stayed in my mind, you know, as like kind of like they have illuminated certain feelings I had, but given me like practical ways to speak about them. I absolutely love that. And thank you for that. And I have to say that some of the things that's made me the most proud about that column was very early on, I had ASC members, I had absolutely veteran cinematographers coming up to me saying, oh, I love the shot craft that you did. It was just a great way of thinking about that or, oh my God, I learned from it. And it was really eye-opening for me to see I always thought I was writing that column for aspiring cinematographers who were reading the magazine and then realized that I was writing it for the, the whole readership, which includes my heroes as well as my contemporaries, as well as the aspiring cinematographers. And that's, that's made me really proud. And it's something that I think about every month when I'm putting that together. And even the endorsements that I've gotten on the Shotcraft book have been humbling and really rewarding Academy Award winning cinematographers telling me that they really enjoy reading and learning from this text. And then that's, it's really gratifying that people receive it that way. I also have to say that it, as technical editor for American Cinematographer, there's, there's a lot of situations where a cinematographer will make a statement based on something that they think they understand. <laughs> That's completely wrong. And then it becomes a very delicate job to go back to that cinematographer and, and in some cases, legendary individuals to say, well, unfortunately, that's not accurate. But let's talk about what your intention was and what you really meant. Mm -hmm. And then we make sure that that doesn't end up in the magazine. Because a big thing for me with American Cinematographer is the understanding that that's history. We are, for all intents and purposes, the magazine of record for cinematography. And if we print something, that becomes fact. Right or wrong, it becomes referenced and read and regurgitated fact. So I, I take that job extraordinarily seriously to challenge myself on every story I read to make sure that everything in it is right. That is really interesting. I'm curious to go into something a little bit more specifically that you brought up talking about the education part, which was that I heard you talk about the disassociation between photo sites and resolution and how the resolution branding machine can sometimes be very confusing. And I'd love to just hear you talk a little bit about that disassociation and what some of the misinformation is, I guess, surrounding resolution. Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of that falls into marketing. It falls in, into the way that digital cameras have been sold. 
there is a distinctive difference between resolution, which is a system's ability to resolve detail, and that is the entire optical transfer function of the system, which is not just the sensor, it's the lens, it's the codec, it's the post-processing, it's the debayering or debiring algorithm that's involved. All of that plays a role in the amount of detail that is finally resolved in the image. So that, that the whole cascading function of all of that is the optical transfer function. Camera manufacturers sell their cameras based on the K numbers, right? And we've had the K wars for a few years, 2K, 4K, 6K, 8K, 12K. We're gonna get up to 16K, 24K. But those Ks are only referring to photo sites, which are individual light sensitive elements of a digital sensor. And those are completely separate concepts. And I kind of briefly threw out the term a little bit earlier of Nyquist Shannon sampling theorem, but just in understanding sampling, it takes twice as many samples as the finest detail that you can resolve. So we can say that a sensor has 4K or 4,496 photosites across it, but the finest detail that sensor is going to be able to reproduce because of sampling is a 2000. So we have to understand the separation between what people say, hey, what is the resolution of that camera? Oh, it's a 6K. No, that is a photo site count and potentially a pixel count in the final image, which are not one to one either, but it does not talk about resolution. What is the finest detail that we can resolve with this system? So, th th I mean, this has been a battle that I've fought for well over a decade in trying to clarify the understanding of these two terms and use it properly. And I find myself falling into it too. I'll be like, oh yeah, what is the resolution of the Venice 2? No, oh, damn it. What, what is the photo site count of the Venice 2? You know, and they even trying to train Google, right? But it, this is important for cinematographers to understand because it gets into the foundation of what can we resolve detail-wise, controlling that image and knowing what those details, how they relate back to the final image, and being able to answer questions like when the costume designer comes up to you and says, will this jacket be okay? What they don't know that they're asking is, Will the spatial frequency of the textile detail here break the Nyquist Shannon of our photographic system? So the cinematographer has to understand and be like, no, that's not, no, that's not going to be good. Or, oh, it's fine. If only they knew what they were asking us. <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. Exactly. One of these days I'll have a costume designer come up and be like, is this okay for Nyquist Shannon? Yeah. And I'll be like, <laughs> Then you'll know that's who you work with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Thank you for breaking that down. It's fascinating. Is there any value in what streamers or studios ask for in their resolution, like requirements? Is there any like point to that from your perspective? Boy, that's a complicated question. The most famous streamer in this is Netflix. And Netflix has made the demand that the sensor and the pixel capture, I guess we can say the sensor capture, let's get between photosites and pixels and talk about sensors, has to be at least 4,096 across. And that was controversial because that made a lot of cameras that high-end cinematographers did not consider professional tools, it made them qualified while disqualifying some of the top tools in the industry at the time. But the reason behind that was Netflix was charging a premium rate for a 4K delivery. And basically their lawyers told them in order to do this, to advertise and to charge a rate, you have to be able to stand behind this is true 4K. And so they said, okay, great. We have to make sure we set this baseline. It doesn't have anything to do really with the audience experience. The Academy, SIMPTI, the digital cinema initiatives, all of them have done various testing on human perspective of resolution. And you know, this also goes back to 
auto shade and auto shades experimentations of human perspective of sharpness. And luckily it turns out that what humans need to be able to see in order to know that the image is in focus and sharp is very low spatial frequency detail. I need to see the shape of your face, the shape of your eyes. I don't need to see every hair in your eyebrow sharp to know that you're in focus to me. So when we start getting into higher and higher display rates, getting into 8K, most of these tests are showing that people can't discern a difference. People can't tell a difference between 4K and 8K when they're looking at it. So <laughs> it's a complicated subject. But at the same time, when it comes into capture tools, talking about sampling again, the more photo sites that we have on that original sampling, the better master will get at the outside at the cascade of the optical transfer function. So the more sampling that we can get, the better color fidelity we get, the better detail we get, and the more true master. Then we can mess it up, right? Because we get into digital being too clean and then turn to things like K35s or Speed Pancro Series 2 or Kawa Cine Promenars which do not have the resolution or the contrast to resolve what the camera is capable of to fuck up the image and make it look more creative. So interesting. It doesn't surprise me at all that so much of it was related to the story of the lawyers and everything. It's, it's fascinating. Or at least, yeah, that, that decision of that number case. I was curious, actually, now that we're talking about sort of resolution of lenses, I think this is something that starting out, I definitely was not thinking about lenses having a resolution, but then learning more and, and especially with resources like the Cine Lens Manual, like starting to understand that more fully. And I was just curious, like when your research for the book, did you come across any lenses that were like particularly remarkable in terms of resolution? And what were some of those lenses? I'm just curious. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a very incestuous relationship between contrast and resolution. They're dependent upon each other and it's often hard to tell the difference between them. But lenses with high resolving detail and high contrast become extremely sharp lenses. I think some of the ones that I was the most impressed with were the Panavision Primo 70s, which might be the highest performance mm. optics that Panavision has ever created. And they're also doing that by not just what's in the actual lens, but in an optical block that they physically put into each individual camera to make sure that that lens is the perfect image on the sensor. So they're taking it a step further. They're saying, this lens is amazing. Now the camera's a little off, so we're going to adjust for that mm. to hit it perfect. And it's phenomenal what you get out of that. There's also a lot of lenses like uh, Sigmas that have incredible contrast and resolution to them that are really surprising. Yeah. And I guess on the other end, I mean, you kind of already mentioned this, but I'm assuming K35, Cook S2 is on the lower resolution end. Is that safe to say? Or any that jumped out at you as particularly low resolution? What's fascinating, especially in when you just talk about the Cook Series 2 Pancros, Speed Pancros, they actually have a relatively high resolution, but they have a low contrast. Hmm. So they wind up getting a softer overall feel to the image, but they resolve detail really well. Cook lenses have been at the top of our game since their introduction in the 1920s. So there's an interesting separation there between the lens's ability to resolve detail and the lens's ability to resolve contrast. And so much of that has to do with flare as well. And it's something that modern coatings have helped lenses become better at resolving detail because it's improved the contrast reproduction. I'm jumping all over the place, but yeah, it, it's interesting to put something like a Series 2 Pancro on a projector and to be able to see incredible fine detail out of them, but also a lot of pluming and contrast and halation coming out of that lens because it doesn't have the contrast control. Fascinating. Yeah. So Jay, getting into like kind of the history of lenses a bit, uh, I've heard you talk eloquently about how lenses kind of exist as this conduit between 
light photons and the capture medium and how it's this analog intermediary between the natural world and the captured image. And I was curious to hear you talk a little bit about how the tools and the physics of optics have remained pretty much fixed for centuries. And I just find that so fascinating because, you know, like we were talking about earlier, so much of the other pipeline of cinematography changes by the day, but lenses have always been a similar design and things. So I'd be curious to hear you talk about that in general, but also why that makes lenses such a special and precious part of the cinematography process. Well, yeah, we had a lot of people asking us while we were doing the Cine Lens Manual, how are you going to keep up with technology and how are you going to do a book on all of this? And so, well, actually, 95% of this has been the same for 150 years. You know, it's uh, light through glass or light through an optical medium. We've understood those physics dating back to the early 1700s, really, starting with, you know, telescopes and then into microscopes and then into the invention of camera and the photographic lenses. And it, the concepts don't change. Physics is physics. It's what it takes to take a ray of light and to bend it to our will. You know, that's really what we're doing. We're taking photons and we're forcing them onto the path that we want them to be in order to create an image of what we're seeing in the world. It's the same way that the eyeball works. So what's fascinating within that are the technological innovations that have happened over the century and a half of photographic optics to get to the point where we are now that starts with improved polishing of silicon made glass to the introduction of other chemicals, you know, starting with lead and then moving into, you know, lanthanum and all of these other chemical compositions into the glass component itself that helps to refine the path of light into lens coatings. Lens coatings were a massive, massive jump forward in optical technology starting in the 1940s. Now into computer-aided optical design, where it used to take a hundred people months, even years to calculate the ray path through a single lens that can now be done in minutes on a program. So it allows designers to iterate a lot faster and prove out their concepts a lot faster so we can introduce new products a lot faster. But the concepts are the same. It's still light through glass and the way that light refracts and absorbs and reflects through optical elements. And that's how we end up with lenses. So it's, I've said this a number of times, but my passion in this is the perfect hybrid between hard science and physics and some sort of magical voodoo that is an intangible that appeals to the creative aspect that we make choices in order to tell a particular story. And that fascinates me. Now, all of this can change. There are things like meta lenses that don't incorporate optical. They're really more of a photon sensing system similar to a digital sensor that meta lenses could be something that'll probably come up in cell phones first than it will photographic cameras. But the real technical innovation that I'm excited about and I'm hoping comes sooner than later is 3D printing of optical elements for photographic lenses. We can do 3D printing for eyeglasses right now for single elements. But, and that's creating a lens that is perfect curvature, perfect polish, perfect coatings, straight out of the printer. When we can do that for photographic optical elements, then we can create truly free form elements on a mass scale. And basically our lenses can do anything we could ever want them to do. We could end up with impossibly fast lenses. We could end up with impossibly sharp lenses. We could end up with a variable lens that can adjust anything that you want, which is a big thing that I keep asking manufacturers for. Make them variable. And a few are doing that now, and I'm, I'm running off on a lot of tangents here, but... Uh, are there any of those emerging technologies that you think could break, like, the physics of optics, like the underlying science? Um... It's, yes and no. I mean, you know, we, we can't really violate physics. We're governed by those laws. 
but we can continue to innovate and improve on our control of what they can do. Right now, the, the kind of the theoretical fastest lens is about a 0 0.7, 0 0.65, 0 0.7. And that gets into uh, all sorts of very complicated limitations of physics. If we're able to create freeform optics and perfect optical coatings, could we bypass that? Technically, maybe we could. And maybe do it in something that's a reasonable size and not a 300 pound piece of glass you're trying to put on a camera. So there's possibilities that we can maximize our control of light, but we're still always going to be governed by physics. So we can we can't go faster than the speed of light. We can't time travel. You know, there are some limitations. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious, as much as you're willing to talk about it, would you be willing to talk at all about some lenses that you've seen that do have variable characteristics? I haven't tried any of them, but I think Ari now has a set, and I think I've seen Master Belt as well. But have you had a chance to play with some of these newer lenses that allow you to turn a ring similar to aperture or focus and adjust the character? Yes. So Katie Williams and I did a pretty extensive test of the autoblots which are a, a team between Otto Nemens and PS Technique. Uh, and they're taking Hasselblad lenses, rehousing them, and then adding a third ring to adjust character. And actually what they're doing with that third ring is moving the rear elements further away from the sensor to break the correction of field flatness. So they're taking you know, forcing the field, the flat field, and they're breaking it to impose field curvature on the image. So your edges go out of focus. Fantastic. Really, really great. They've done a great job throughout the series of making it fairly consistent so that a one on a 50 mil is very equal to the image of a one on a 75 and a one on a 25. They've done a really, really great job of, of refining that. Airy has the hero look lens, which is a similar concept, but they're taking a little bit of a different approach to it. It's one focal length and it's a very aggressive look as you adjust this characteristic. So I think that there's limited aspect to that. I haven't seen yet what the master built have done. But there's also the Module 8 that has just come out, which is an adapter designed by Ian Neal, winner of 13 Academy Awards for optical design, including the Gordon E. Sawyer Award. It's like I'm selling his resume. <laughs> but this is a, it's a beautiful adjustable adapter that sits between the camera and the lens in mm -hmm. order to induce aberrations. And it's done by one of our top optical designers in our industry to really target characteristics and impose aberrations on the image for creative use. So those are the ones that I've played with and I'm really excited about. I'm still trying to get manufacturers to put a third ring on to give us various levels of undercorrected spherical aberration. It's one of the most coveted aspects of aberrations that cinematographers look for in lenses and why we choose different lenses and having the ability to adjust it would be extraordinary and mechanically and optically it's not that hard to do so i keep poking manufacturers for this and um so far none of them have taken me up on it but i'm waiting and so that characteristic being like the swirly look or the kind of fall off that you get on the edges it's really spherical aberration, especially undercorrected spherical aberration, is really a lot more about taking a single point of light and defocusing it. Mm. So you get a little bit more of a softer look. Fall off is one thing that will absolutely come with induced spherical aberration. But you also get a smoother bouquet. Mm. So you get a creamierness to the out of focus aspect. Not necessarily the Petzval swirl that we're kind of used to. That's something that happens more with occlusion of the pupil. So there are, there are ways to induce that look by kind of occluding, I'm trying to get my paws into the image here, uh, occluding oblique rays of light that are not part of the image formation can give you that petzval swirl. So spherical aberrations is separate from that idea. 
but it, it's it creates these you know detail sharp but still soft feeling lenses that are lovely and to be able to dial that in on a shot by shot basis is extraordinary it's so interesting yeah one of the things that i happen to like when i look for a series of lenses is a variable look right basically wide open they have a lot of aberrations so wide open they're going to have more spherical aberration and more chromatic aberration and more flare and more pupil aberration and then you stop down a little bit and that all gets cleaned up what that means to me is with that single focal length or that series on a shot by shot basis just by adjusting my aperture i can control the character of that lens and that's a powerful tool i can say okay on this shot of ava right now she's backlit i have too much flare so i have to shoot this at a 182 but on this next shot i want more flare it's a little flat for me so now i'm going to open up to a 15 or a 14 or a 13 and i'm going to get more flare softer image and have that ability shot by shot to control things and that's exciting to me yeah i have a, a follow up question that maybe might come off as a little contrarian but i'd be really interested to hear how you answer this and i'm just thinking about someone like Roger Deakins who famously does not care to change his camera or his lenses a lot from movie to movie and starting out as a dp i think i was really into lenses because that was something i could grasp as like oh this is a different thing and it's doing this and i think that over time i've started to vacillate between caring less or not caring as much on certain projects because i have also been thinking about the lighting or your LUT also changes your contrast. And those elements too have a way of shaping the image. Now it's like you can't control like fall off and certain things like that, but like perceived sharpness, I think if you have very beautiful soft lighting with master primes, it just takes the edge off or takes the edge away that a very sharp lens might have. So I think that because I know that in shotcraft you go very in depth into like lighting and that's something you know a lot about too. Is there also, when you're like educating aspiring DPs, is there also an importance of being like, hey, listen, lenses are great and sexy, you know, and easy to fall in love with, but like these are other things that really matter too, you know? Absolutely. And part of the reason why I talk so much about lenses is because I wrote a book about it. <laughs> um, and it, it's just a little <laughs> bit of a, a snide response, but um, in my career, I studied light. Constantly. I tested light. I studied lighting. I studied the physics of it, the control of it, and harnessed it. And, you know, I came up as an electrician and a gaffer, so I knew that. I knew light inside and out. I got it. What I didn't know was lenses. And I realized that there's very little education out there about lenses, mm. and a lot of it's wrong. And that's what inspired me to go into it. So then now, because I have that book, a lot of people come to me and let's talk about lenses. But you're absolutely right. Light is a massive part of the cinematographer's job. And there's no doubt that Roger Deakins is one of the masters of our trade in our lifetime. Roger is the top of his game. And you're absolutely right. Roger sticks with master primes and airy cameras. And before that, it was Cook's S4s or S5s. And he doesn't want to play with lenses. He doesn't want to mess up the image. He wants to get the strongest, clearest image as possible, and control it through his light. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. And you're completely right. We can control the audience's perception of the image through the way that we light it. If I'm lighting with soft light, we're going to see more depth of field in the image because it's harder to discern what's in focus and what isn't in focus. All of it plays into what the cinematographer has to do. The thing that I found really passionate about lenses is that it was a subject that wasn't as talked about for many years. And it is one of the tools that you can do, in addition to lighting, to bake your look as a cinematographer into the image. Relying on LUT or relying on post-correction takes some of that out of the cinematographer's hands and their responsibility. And there is a possibility 
that those concepts can be changed and completely obliterated later on. I cannot tell you how many jobs as a cinematographer that I was not even involved in post. I wasn't invited to the color session. And the final image that came out was very different from what the director and I had discussed and what we planned. And some of that comes down to producers and some of that comes down to the director changing their mind. And some of it comes down to they didn't know any better. So things like lighting and lenses helps the cinematographer control the image at its foundation and maintain integrity over that image. But all of it's important. It's all incredibly important. None more so than anything else. Yeah. I think the point about the LUT is very true. And David Mullen actually gave us a pretty wild story about having that exact thing happen uh, where the entire look of the film changed. And of course, we all have that story, but it was awesome to hear from him and to also hear it from you. Yeah, it, it's heartbreaking and terrible. Yeah, totally. And then you end up sort of disavowing any relationship with that project, being like, mm, yeah, <laughs> that is not what I shot. <laughs> Sorry. 100%. Yep. <laughs> Hi, we are excited to announce our partnership with Laua Lenses by Venus Optics. Laua has had a long history of providing cinematographers with unique and state-of-the-art lens options, including their recent Proteus 2x Anamorphic series, which remains the most accessible T2.0 option in the market for professional production. A big thank you to Sandus for helping support our show as well as part of their relentless reliability campaign. The extreme portable solid state drive has become an essential on film sets and a personal favorite of mine for how durable, reliable, and fast it is. Sandus leads in drive and memory card technology, emphasizing not just storage, but everything worth keeping. We'd also like to thank our partner at Fujifilm. We're very grateful to them for supporting not just the podcast, but a lot of what we do at the Cinematography Salon. And with the release of their latest camera, GFX 100 the second, they release a tool that opens up new creative possibilities. It's brands like these that remind us why we do what we do. It's more than just support. It's about being part of a community that values every shot and every story. Yeah, so Jay, you were just talking a little bit about depth of field, and I heard something really interesting in the process of you putting together the Cine Lens Manual, which is that you discovered that there was quite a bit of misinformation out there. And a lot of the process you talked about of creating that book was erasing some of the indoctrination that exists around certain topics related to cinematography. And it was something that I found really interesting because I think when we think about misinformation and things like that, to hear that it happens from a technical place with some of the technical texts that some of us may have relied on as a resource, it was just really fascinating to me. So one example you brought up were discoveries surrounding depth of field and specifically how focal distance has more influence over depth of field than focal length. And I'd love to just hear you talk a little bit about figuring out how to sift through some of the misinformation out there and specifically that discovery about depth of field. Wow. Yeah, that's a big one. And really, while we were doing the book, I spent almost an entire year really focused on depth of field. A lot of research and intense amount of testing because... I came across a concept that was the antithesis of what I knew. And it took a long time to be able to wrap my head around, no, actually this concept is right and what I know is wrong. But what I know is all the textbooks that I've read. So how can that be wrong? And so it, it took a, a long time for me to get to a point where I had to completely erase everything I've ever known and say, forget it, I'm gonna start from scratch and I'm gonna relearn this subject. And I'm going to do it through practical testing. And I'm going to do it through understanding the physics. I spent an, almost an entire year understanding what happens to light as it passes through the lens and understanding focus. And tangential to this, in my second book, I wrote a sentence in that talking about how human beings see a succession of still images as motion. And I used the phrase persistence of vision because that's what I had been taught. And then after that book was published, I came to find that concept had been refuted about 50 years ago, and it was wrong. So I had just regurgitated something that I had read and known and just knew instinctually, and it was wrong. And that, it crushed me. It's a single sentence in the book, but it really bothered me that I put something out there that was wrong. So in everything that I write, in everything that I do, I never take any knowledge for granted. It's always re-researched 
and redefines and reconfirmed to make sure that what I think I know is actually correct. The depth of field thing started to come up really when we moved to the early digital cameras and even experience in early digital video. I did a lot in, in DV for a number of years, and I did a lot with the F900 camera, the first move into digital cinema cameras. And we were dealing with a smaller sensor, and we're dealing with significantly more depth of field than we're used to in 35 millimeter. So we're all trying to do all these kinds of tricks, right, to mimic the depth of field of 35. And something that would happen all the time is we'd end up with a shot, okay? Director likes this composition, likes the shot, too much depth of field. We'll say, okay, let's move to a longer lens further away because everybody knows longer lenses have less depth of field than shorter lenses and wider lenses. So we'll move to a longer lens further away, we'll get less depth of field. And I had seen that discussion damn near come to a fist fight on set with a cinematographer saying, no, that it, it's not going to make a difference. The director said, well, of course it is. Every textbook I pull out, look, in this manual it says, longer lenses have less depth of field. Well, okay. So this is what I had to dive into, right? I had to really break down, to divorce myself of all of that and get into physics. And one of the first things that was so hard for me to accept, we put so much importance on a circle of confusion the number of circle of size of the circle of confusion. And in my career as a DP, when I was shooting film, we'd lived by it. We'd lived by a Kelly wheel or the depth of field charts in the ASC manual. It was just bread and butter, right? And everything, everything in that is based on a circle of confusion. And I came to the point in my research to realize that that number, that hardcore number that every depth of field calculator is based on is completely arbitrary. It's really just a wild fucking guess. <laughs> because, and this is the thing that I finally had to kind of start to realize was those numbers are based in still photography generally early on. And it's based on taking a certain size negative, making a certain size print, and then a human being with perfect vision viewing that print from a certain distance. So we say that, okay, we're gonna base the Nikon circle of confusion based on a 35 millimeter negative, blown up to an eight by 10 print, viewed from a distance of 14 inches. And under those parameters, a human being can discern this size of point as being in focus or out of focus. And that defines a circle of confusion, great. But if that human being steps back to two feet, it's a completely different circle of confusion. Or if they lean up to two inches away, if you can focus that close, that's a completely different circle of confusion. If the lens doesn't have the resolving power, if the print doesn't have, the paper doesn't have the resolving power, none of it, it's all a guessing game, right? But when shooting film, you can't see really what's in focus or out of focus. So you need a fundamental basis to estimate what will be in acceptable focus. And that's where all of these charts and estimations come from, but they're estimations. So that was a huge thing. Like, oh my God, circle of confusion is bullshit. It's completely not dependent on what I'm doing in this scene. So divorce myself of all of that and then learn what the real parameters of depth of field are, which is focus distance is the most influential factor on depth of field, aperture size, and then focal length. So because focus distance has more influence on depth of field than focal length, in that scenario of taking a wider lens closer, matching that shot with a longer lens further away, because you've increased the distance, the difference in focal length is negated. Mm. And that's one of the things that just, man, I, I could not tell you realistically, probably 30 to 40 different tests trying to prove that concept and make sure that it was right and it wasn't wrong because it, it spits in the face of most indoctrination, right? Longer focal length lenses have less depth of field 
at a given focus distance. So if I take a 50 millimeter lens at five feet and a 100 millimeter lens at five feet, at the same stop, the 100 millimeter lens will have less depth of field, but it will also have an entirely different shot. So when we equalize our fields of view, then we negate the influence of focal length on depth of field. And man, that was like, then we, once I got to that point, then I went to Ian Neal and I was like, Ian, let's talk about this concept. And he's like, oh, of course, yes. I, that's been a problem that people have been talking about for years and getting wrong. And let's talk about the physics involved in it. I was like, oh my God, okay. And there was a huge day for me, like, oh, let's confirming what I've been doing for the last six months. Yes, the physics prove it out in his room. Wow. Wow. I just had to throw in that Ian Neal impersonation too. Love that. It's really, it was really well done. Uh, <laughs> that was an incredible description. I mean, yeah, I find this so fascinating. And um, part of me thinks about how appealing it is to people aesthetically to have like a super wide angle lens, incredibly close to talent for similar reasons, you know, like it's more about focal distance and how that affects depth of field in those scenarios than focal length or like you said, aperture, et cetera. It's fascinating. It's one of the reasons that's made a full frame format appealing because the larger sensor forces a longer focal length at the same distance as Super 35. And then the focal length has a bearing on the amount of depth of field. So that's why full format works. It has less depth of field than Super 35 because for the same shot, for the same angle of view, we're using longer focal length lenses at the same distance. Yep, distance being the key thing. So interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for letting me go off on that diatribe because of course, yeah, it, it was a hard year. <laughs> I love it. I've loved everything you've had to say about lenses. I'm definitely going to buy the book now. Um, I was going to already, but <laughs> now I'm definitely going to. <laughs> but if we switch gears from lenses, I would love to hear what you've discovered with HDR and specifically, like, how would you recommend DP start thinking about shooting for uh, HD on early on in a project? HDR is huge. And early on, I, I was really tentative about it. And my first practical experience with it was on an ASC project called the STEM 2, the Standard Evaluation Material Version 2, which is a short film that is given to the industry royalty-free and rights-free to be utilized as a test material for digital projection systems, laser projection, emissive screens, theatrical projection, monitor companies, image manipulation companies. And we did it because we had to deal with all of modern exhibition. We did it in HDR, right? Sort of the joke there is that we've been shooting in HDR for 100 years, almost 100 years, because film negative was a significant high dynamic range. And digital has been high dynamic range pretty much since we've professionally embraced it. So we've always captured more dynamic range than we could ever exhibit. And the exhibition is where the limitation was. And that film print had a limited dynamic range and television had a limited dynamic range. So now we get into starting with television. Television manufacturers started making high dynamic range TVs that could show us a wider range, which changed the image. Now, early on, of course, the thing was, it's brighter, right? Oh, you can get brighter, you get brighter highlights. And we get brighter images. And mostly TV manufacturers are pushing that because most TVs are sitting in a bright living room. You don't want a 100 nit SDR TV. You want a 1,000 nit HDR TV to get a bright, colorful image, right? Where that really comes in for filmmakers and cinematographers is we get to express a wider dynamic range. There's less compromise than previously. And this is including theater now, too. We have high dynamic range now coming out for theatrical exhibition. So we get to see more subtleties, more subtle gradations, and a more refined image. But the true thing that finally sold me on it and that I got excited about is because exhibition 
is improving theatrically and at home. It gives a better integrity of the filmmaker's intention to the audience. So the real value of HDR to me as a filmmaker is that what I do in the mastering suite actually gets damn close to ending up to what the audience sees. And being aided by tools like Filmmaker Mode or Technicolor Mode in home television that shuts off all the bullshit that manufacturers put in in motion smoothing and extra saturation and digital sharpening and takes advantage of the high dynamic range, shuts all that other crap off, and it means the image that we set in the color suite actually shows up at home and in the theater. To me, that's the most exciting aspect of HDR. How that works for the cinematographer, if you are still on set monitoring traditionally in legacy SDR, we'd be monitoring in 709, that's what we've done for decades, then what shows up in the high dynamic range could be a surprise. And it could be what was not intended. And you end up with a struggle in post-production to start controlling that image to get what you wanted. We really need to move to a world where everyone is monitoring HDR on set, seeing the full image, and then controlling within that image exactly what they want to see. And that might be the limitations of 709. You might want creatively to get that limited six to eight stop dynamic range. And that's the idea. Or you might want more detail in the shadows or brighter highlights. You know, one of the early examples that I saw in testing of HDR was from Pixar's Inside Out. And it was a test that was shown to us at 300 nits, I believe, theatrically. So we're in a dark theater and the film opens with the lead character being born. So the opening image is a bright white screen and a baby who is blinking against the brightness of the world. And Pixar pushed that bright white screen to the maximum peak brightness of that theatrical screen. And it hurt. It physically, literally hurt to look at it. And I realized instantly, holy shit, we are able creatively to put the audience into the physical experience of that character and make our audience a little uncomfortable. Now, I think they pushed it too far in that example because it was painful instead of just being a slight empathetic discomfort. So I did the same thing with the STEM2 project. There's a, a scene where the lead character is using a device to drill into some rocks and there's all these sparks going. And I pushed those sparks just to the edge of discomfort for high-end theatrical 300 nit presentation so that as an audience member, you start to squint just like the characters are. And the ability to do that, to play with your audience a little bit is really exciting. Now, don't do it too much because you're going to piss people off. But imagine an action film where an explosion physically causes the audience to go, whoa. And that's possible with high dynamic range and high dynamic range theatrical projection systems, which are now really coming into fruition on a higher level than what Dolby Vision has been able to do. And it's exciting to be part of that, and it's exciting to see it. Answering back to your question, long, long diatribe. I need to shut up, but the cinematographer needs to be monitoring the full image on set because you make so many decisions based on the image that you see. So you're making exposure decisions, you're making color decisions, you're making light quality decisions based off the monitor. Even though we all would say, oh, no, I might use a meter, I might use a waveform, we're still looking at the damn monitor and we're making our decisions. 
we need to see that entire image to make the right decision and then deal with it later in post. Yeah. Wow. And I can expound on this for another half hour because basically with the STEM too, we stumbled into a situation utilizing ACEs where I created a single master that then through ACEs transforms hits every deliverable perfectly. Mm. So we hit 1000 nit master that created our 300 nit deliverable, our 108 Dolby vision deliverable, our 100 nit standard definition television deliverable, and our 48 nit traditional theatrical deliverable, all from a single master because we worked with high dynamic range and aces. And that was mind blowing to me. Sorry, that's too much. That's really interesting. Yeah, that's like comforting to know that you can technically do that, but also scary to think that there's a whole world that I'm not fully <laughs> tapped into that I should be aware of, you know? Yeah. And part of where cinematographers get bit by that is we're still working legacy on the set and you're shooting a certain image and you're adjusting your exposures to a Rec. 709 monitor. And then your project gets distributed to Amazon or Netflix and they require an HDR deliverable. And so many times that just happens without you. So you've mastered, you've been in that color suite, you've done that 709, and then suddenly the production company gets that release and they have to hire a colorist to make an HDR deliverable and you're not there for it. And then you see that and like, whoa, wait a minute. That's, why is that lamp so bright in the background? I'm not paying attention to the actor anymore. I'm paying attention to practical. What the, it's completely a surprise. And that's where things are a problem. So. The cinematographer has to take control of it by monitoring and seeing it on set. Yeah, I have one clarification about what you said. When you had said that film, like you said there was like a joke about film having HDR already. Um, yeah. Were you talking about exhibition in a theater as well as the negative itself? No, the negative has a high dynamic range. We've had negative at 10, 11, 12 stops of dynamic range really since the 1970s. It's a little bit limited before that, but the evolution of T-grain stops the EXR stocks from Kodak into the Vision line, the Vision 2, Vision 3, we've had an extraordinary dynamic range. But film print was very limited in its dynamic range. And we really were only getting about six to eight stops out of a print. Digital projection was designed to emulate a film print, struck off an original camera negative, which is a high bar. But so the original digital projection was designed to match those same limitations. Mm. So theatrical exhibition has been limited to standard dynamic range all the way up really until the introduction of Dolby Vision, which is now at 108 nit instead of 48 nit. And now there is a new digital cinema initiative standard for theatrical at 300 nit. And one digital projection company that I'm aware of that has technology coming out able to hit that. So fascinating. Uh, I'm curious in the case of like STEM2, what kind of production monitor hardware were you guys working with for cinematographers thinking about down the line, like what to look out for in order to be able to monitor on set? What were you guys working with? So depending upon the location that we were at, we had either a Canon or a Sony HDR monitor on set. And my co-producer and post-production supervisor, who is a color scientist, uh, Joachim Zell, calibrated these monitors for us and provided a switch to go between standard Rec. 709 SDR or full range HDR. Hmm. And again, sort of a confession to that, uh, Christopher Probst, ASC, was my cinematographer on that project. And both Chris and I, you know, we've got 20 years of looking at SDR. That's what we're used to. That's what we base everything on. And when we looked at the HDR signal, we didn't trust it. We didn't really know what we were looking at. Like, it looks like just a poorly corrected monitor. And, and we didn't understand how to process those thoughts. Right. So both of us looked at SDR 
probably 95% of the time on STEM two. I would toggle back and forth to look and see what does the HDR look like, and then immediately go, oh, no, 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 back to SDR, <laughs> because I didn't trust it. I hadn't been through the process. And it took going through the many, many iterations that we did in post, because we did an individual deliverable for every standard first before we found the single master. Because I forced post-production to do what I was used to, which is let's start. I want to make that master look with Chris sitting next to me for a 48 knit theatrical. That's what our master is going to be. Then I'm going to make a 100 knit television, a 108 knit Dolby Vision, and a 300 knit theatrical, and a 1,000 knit home television. And my thought was every one of those was going to have to be different because I was maximizing that technology because this project was designed to push the limits of every technology. Then what I wound up finding once we got to that thousand nit version, and we're talking two months worth of color sessions. Once we finished the thousand nit, I was happy with it. Great. My color said, let me show you something. And he took that file and we went back into the theater where we started and he put the thousand nit up and he switched it to a 48 nit ODT. And I watched it and went, that's perfect. That's exactly what we, that's what we wanted. Yep. And then he switched to hundred nit and showed it to me on a TV. And I was like, Oh, that looks perfect. So we wasted two months <laughs> chasing our tails. And, and most of it was because I didn't have experience in it. So I went with what I trusted. Now that I know what I'm looking at, that I know what to experience, now I understand HDR on the set. And now I, I follow a lot more of like the Eric Messerschmidt concept of we need to be looking at HDR on the set, see the full range of the image, make exposure decisions based on that full range, and then we can truncate that. And I wound up producing a masterclass for masters for the ASC members that Armando Salas, ASC, taught. And he takes that same perspective of Eric Messerschmidt, except Armando creates a LUT that also shows Rec. 709. So it's a color-managed LUT to look at HDR and Rec. 709 on the same set, and they're going to look damn similar because it's a color-managed pipeline, and he can make decisions based on both of them. Complicated world out there, guys. you got to follow the technology. <laughs> This is so helpful to hear. I mean, it's so fascinating. I, do you think now if you were to go back and look at that same monitor on set, you'd probably be looking more at the HDR switch than the... 100%. Yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah. I can't wait to uh, experiment with this and learn more about it. Yeah, I have one follow-up question about that. And that would be that, you know, as we've seen over time, digital cinematography wanting to emulate film more and more, you know, it started with, Ari's color science being close to film or what we thought film looked like. And then Sony and red kind of followed suit trying to get their like color space to look similar to Ari's or to film. Do you think that audiences will embrace an HDR look if it's completely different from how we've viewed it in the past? If really we're used to, you know, 120 years of looking at a certain thing. Do we even want that? So I'll, I'll recount an anecdote that was shared with me. It wasn't my experience, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, David Stump, ASC, had a day, I, I guess, with his family where he was the designated babysitter for a bunch of his nieces and nephews. And during that time, they're you know in the 10, 11, 12 age range, and they wound up putting on the movie Tomb Raider. And about halfway through watching it, David looked to one of his nephews and said, what do you think of this? And the nephew's like, well, it's not that great. And David's like, yeah, I agree. And the nephew says, it just doesn't look like the game. <laughs> and it, it totally melted Dave's brain. And when he shared this with me, it melted my brain because what we're dealing with, the introduction of digital cinema was catering to a generation of filmmakers that were used to the look of film. That's what we grew up with. That's what we love. 
That's what we emulate. That's what we see when we dream and when we think about movies. The generation coming up, even behind you guys, is more used to seeing things on their phone or immersive video games or VR and are coming in with a different experience. So it's highly possible that the audience's desires will evolve beyond what we traditionally want. You know, we look at like James Cameron or Peter Jackson or Ang Lee, these filmmakers who are pushing for higher frame rates. Now, I am not a fan of it. I actually very uncomfortable watching a high frame rate theatrical release. Uh, it doesn't feel right to me because I'm used to 24 frames per second. That's my life. It's, I dream in 24 frames per second. So seeing something different that's a little sharper, that's less motion blur is uncomfortable for me. But a 10-year-old, they're used to seeing 60 frames a second in every game that they play. So the looks may evolve. At the same time, you don't have to utilize HDR for its full range. You as an artist have the ability to control that image exactly how you want. And as of now, there's no exhibitor placing demands on the specifications of that HDR. So no exhibitor is saying, you have to give me a thousand nit HDR and your highlights must hit a thousand nits. They're saying, you have to give me a thousand nit HDR deliverable and you can decide my brightest highlight's gonna be a hundred nit and that's it. And so you can do that traditional look within that HDR and it's going to carry and be presented the way you intended. That's kind of, again, the exciting thing about the technology is that it doesn't have to alter the look, but you can if you want to. And it's up to the creative how to use that technology. Therein ends my sales pitch for high dynamic range. And, and really, I, I drink the Kool-Aid. Like, I, I went from being skeptical to now being like one of the biggest evangelists for this technology, mostly because it allows the integrity of the image to be presented the way we want it to. I mean, I'm sure you guys have both experienced sitting in a color suite going, damn, I love this. No one is ever going to see it this way. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Now we can't. And, and that's cool. The thousand net master is so interesting. It's a really interesting thing that I'm very curious to see. All right. Well, Jay, we've reached our final question and this has just been an incredible conversation. I feel like, you know, we were really excited to explore practical concepts that people could really listen to and chew on and unpack. And I feel like we've done that to such an extreme degree, thanks to your knowledge and wisdom about all of these topics. So Thank you. And we kind of wanted to end with a question that was practical, but in a little bit of a different way, a little less technical. I heard you speak about your experience with Hollywood over the decades and how it's a town that is inherently exclusionary and exclusive and how as cinematographers, often it can be hard to face droughts with work and slow periods. And I found something that you said that really resonated with me, which was this idea that in our industry, rejection isn't necessarily something that we experience frequently rather what we tend to experience more often is hollow acceptance and the antidote that you offered for this was education and how that can sometimes really help in those periods of work being slow so with everything that you've prioritized in your career so far and everything i'd love for you to just talk a little bit about the importance of education and what was mentioned about hollow acceptance in this industry <laughs> yeah yeah. Uh, well, you actually put that pretty eloquently. Now I have to struggle to match the way that you phrase that. But what I found you know, coming up, and you know, I, I wanted to direct film since I was five years old. So I, I spent my life dedicated to this industry and to this passion, quite literally. And early on, everyone would say to me, oh, the entertainment industry, that's a really tough industry. There's so much rejection you have to deal with. You got to get a thick skin. And what I actually found entering the professional arena was that you very rarely ever hear no. Generally, what you get is, oh my God, you're amazing. Oh, I love you. We are going to work together. Oh, we're going to do this project. This is great. And then six months go by and, and you never hear anything. And then suddenly you hear that, oh, the film is already made or 
they moved on or, or, or whatever. You know, oh, this is, we love this. We're going to take this project on and we're going to do this. Great, wonderful. And then poof, they're ghosted suddenly. They never respond to you again. And a big part of that is that many people are afraid to say no. Many free people are afraid to reject you, not only just the courtesy of hurting your feelings, but because they never know when you're going to surpass them and become the person who employs them later. So they don't want to say, eh, you know what, uh, Peter, you're not right for this. Thank you. No. And then have you be pissed off and suddenly become the next Roger Deakins. And they're going, oh my God, I wish I worked with Peter. <laughs> so people then tend to be really supportive and really energetic. And sometimes they're genuine about it and they just can't follow through. And sometimes it's completely bullshit and it's hard to see through that. Unfortunately, we work in a gig economy. We work in a gig business. We Almost everybody in the motion picture industry is freelance, which means you work job to job. And sometimes those jobs are a day, sometimes they're six months. But at the end of that finite period, you are unemployed again, and you're looking for the next job. And so we are in a constant state of seeking employment. And there's a lot of feast and famine. The first year that I moved to LA, I was ridiculously lucky. I had a job day one, literally day one. Moving to Los Angeles, I had a job as an electrician. And that first year, boom, I was off. I was working constantly. And I was thinking, this is easy. <laughs> this is not so bad. And then year two, I worked 70 days out of the year and I made an average of $100 a day when I worked. So suddenly I was at a period where I'm literally stealing toilet paper from a fast food restaurant because I, I can't afford it and being afraid to eat because I don't have toilet paper. You know, I mean, that's where I hit at a, at a point in my life. We all deal with these highs and lows. We all deal with a, a depression that hits when we're not working because many of us as creatives are defined by the activities that we do. So there have to be things that we do when we're in those lulls. And the best thing that I found is to take that time and move yourself forward. And you do that by learning. You learn something new. So when you're not working, hit the rental house and test something new. Test a new camera. Test new lenses, pick up a new book, read something new, go out and shoot a test for HDR and start exploring with that. Networking and learning is what we need to do in those lulls to keep sane and to make sure that we're not stagnant because it's far too damn easy to just sit on your ass and binge Netflix when you're not working. Um, and there's value in that too, right? I see so many filmmakers that I talk to and they're like, oh, I don't own a TV or I don't watch movies. Like, what the, what is the matter with you? That's part of the job. <laughs> you have to watch and see what's out there. But anyway, that's how I've kind of helped. But we still, we all struggle with these incredibly low moments. And the higher that I've moved up the food chain, the longer those moments become. I've had this conversation with multiple individuals in recent years that, you know, as a cinematographer, I could move job to job, right? I jump from one show and then the next day I could be on a new show. As a director, I spend months to years developing a project and then get a small period of time where I actually get to do what I love to do. And then I'm back in post for a year or more and then developing the next project. So I'm in this depressive low on a constant basis. And I have to find ways to keep the mind going and keep learning and keep pushing forward, or I would just be festering and marinating in my own juices, uh, sitting in a depressive state and driving my wife nuts. I think that's brilliant. The way that you articulated that is really profound. And I feel like uh, it's also really interesting to hear you talk about it both for cinematographers and for directors, because I think there is a pretty big difference there. And yeah, it's just, it's very interesting and super helpful. Thank you for giving voice to that. I'm sure a lot of people will like to hear that advice. Uh, I, I hope it helps. 
All right. Well, this has been fantastic. Jay, thank you so much for your time. We cannot be more grateful for your wisdom and all of your knowledge on these subjects. And yeah, thank you for coming on the show. Absolutely. It's, you know, I'm very passionate about this business. I love it very much. So it's hard to shut me up, uh, but it's been a lot of fun. I appreciate it. It's been a great conversation. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Jay. This is great. Um, I'm ready for the next uh, class from you. So <laughs> I'm signing Am up. I'm buying the books. I'm signing up. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. This episode of the Cinematography Salon podcast was produced by Peter Pascucci, Ava Benjamin Shore, and David Kruta, with original music by One Wave and edited by Corey Abel. We created this episode in partnership with the Cinematography Salon, and we would like to extend a special thanks to the Salon community for supporting our efforts with this show. We'd also like to extend our gratitude to Able Cine for their continued support. If you're unfamiliar with their offerings, Able Cine provides services such as equipment rentals, sales, maintenance, training, and much more. Additionally, they host complimentary events at their various locations. For more details, please visit ablecine.com. If you enjoyed listening to the show, we encourage you to subscribe to our podcast and follow us on social media to stay up to date with our latest episodes and news. Thanks.